Welcome to uh, Who Owns the Water? And I think it's quite appropriate that it happens to be raining. And, uh, and therefore, we're all sharing the water, that water anyway. Um, not to mention the fact that in terms of the crisis on the planet that we are trying to share, um, water is one of the greatest issues uh, and, and challenges that we have facing us today. And this project that Viba Galhotra has brought to us of who owns the water is probably one of the most pressing that we face. And here at the Asia Society, this project is part of a, a larger project called Creative Common Ground. And it's really in many ways about how, how artists envision the coming together of ideas, not in any particular discipline, but more in terms of the ideas that inspire us and how we work with society and how we bring people together. And uh, we're really delighted to be able to work with her on this project, and you'll hear more about her project. But even beyond that, I think it's the opportunity to bring people who are in the sciences or who are thinking about these projects from a variety of different perspectives, be that social justice or um, policy issues, uh, from the humanities, and really thinking about, well, what do we, how can we come together at this very urgent moment to think about this in new ways? And that's really, I think, at heart, what the arts bring to all of us, because it's about being creative together. At least that's my feeling about it. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that Viba's project that she will tell you a little about is going to be a part of a much larger uh, project that the Asia Society is organizing that will start in June called the Triennial of Asian Art. And that's a, a place that in fact is, it takes the idea of we don't dream alone uh, as a large umbrella, a, a way to envision dreams. And I suppose there are good dreams and bad dreams, but we're sharing them and, and maybe it's in that coming together that it's so much more powerful. But also one of the themes within that project is sustainability. So this really fits in. And please watch out for the, the news about the triennial. Um, you'll have a chance to see some incredible art and uh, hear many speakers and really learn about new ideas or participate in them. So tonight, uh, we're really delighted. Uh, we're going to start with an introduction by Viba Galhotra about her work. We're going to start with a film and then a little bit of a conversation about the work and what's envisioned and, and kind of where her direction is. And then we're going to have the conversation, uh, which Heather Davis will, will introduce. And after that, we'll have a short time for some Q&A, and then we're, we're very uh, happy to have some some Ayurvedic uh, snacks for the reception. We don't usually have Ayurvedic food, so um, we're delighted that Divya's Kitchen has agreed to put some food together that kind of keeps us thinking about water and, and how that contributes to the food and drink that we share that keeps, that sustains us. Anyway, so uh, let's see the film.
Hi everybody. Thank you for coming today. Uh I'm I'm so grateful to Asia Society for giving me this opportunity to do this project which I was doing. So I wanted to show you this uh, film Manthan which I made in Delhi where I live, where I come from. So Delhi has this holy river which crosses Delhi. Um, um so and it is like a sewer. It's no more a river where we go and pray. Uh, so you know, it's like I I am always in a theater of absurd if I go to the river, because one side people are praying the river and doing their holy ceremonies, praying their ancestors and doing all kind of prayers, and go for this holy bath in this sewage, which is uh, the sewage from all the city residential waste and the uh, industrial effluent. um uh, and this is another work which i did who owns the water um precursor to the work which is commissioned by aj society recently um so um yeah so this is where i come from from past 10 years i've been working on uh, water issues around india and uh, around the world and uh, delhi becomes my window because i live there and uh, so uh yeah i think i'm really really concerned about this uh uh element on the planet because that's the most important uh, element on the planet for us to live otherwise we will be shifting to mars if we find the water there <laughs> soon um so uh i rather than speaking much about my earlier practice uh, you can google about it i would like to speak more about the work which is recently commissioned by asia society which will be premiered during the asia triennial um event so there i will be making two versions one is a developing country and one is a developed country uh, conversation where i have invited 20 experts uh, um on water and uh, i curated this dinner uh which was um, you know curated in any every best possible way about water the uh, ayurvedic food was being served because i think uh, all the five elements which are there in the food are in us so that's what uh, the basic was to start with and uh, then i invited the uh, 20 experts uh, from uh, um activist background environmentalist background uh, researchers scientists and academicians to talk about water to have this conversation about water so that we can combine the facts and the fiction in that film uh, so that you will see can can we play the okay ah so these are few images uh, from the event which okay how does this work sorry <laughs> okay this is auto um so this was the dinner table design for the uh, you know mimicking the map of the hudson river because i think um uh, if we talk about the history of chemicals um in the water around the planet it's uh, very high and uh, we cannot go back to the clean water anymore and uh, all over the world we don't have much of a clean water other than the 7% um i don't want to scare you all but that's the reality of the uh, uh water but these are some of the stills from the video which we'll be making and it will be a multi channel video work where everybody who was there they have given their expert views about water and what and how we can do the sustain uh, we can sustain uh the water on the planet for a living uh so yeah i think without going much into it i think i can invite heather to have the panel No. All right. Um I just want to say again uh, thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for hosting us. Um it's a real such an honor and a pleasure um to get to be in conversation with all of you tonight. Um and uh and just a quick um or maybe it shouldn't be quick but um an acknowledgement uh that we are hosting this event on the unceded um territory of the Lenape and Haudenosaunee peoples um and that that acknowledgement should be an acknowledgement that is a call for us to think through practices of decolonization in a settler colonial uh context and not um 
just something that you do so that you can move on, um, but rather the beginning of a much longer uh, project. Um, but it's my deep, uh, deep pleasure to um, introduce to you guys um, Lubna Ahmed, who is uh, very passionate about uh, water and who is here um, as a representative of the amazing environmental justice organization, uh, We Act, which is uh, located um, in northern Manhattan. Um, and Ubmanu Lal, um, who is the director of the Columbia Water Center, um, amongst numerous other uh, very prestigious um, positions, and uh, and who I think we we can call some kind of a water expert, um, <laughs> regardless of how we might feel about that term. Um, and uh, and so um, I just wanted to get to just to start um, to ask. Um, maybe each of you to talk about the ways in which um, you've sort of come to work with water, maybe from a, a personal <coughs> place. Um, and part of part of my question comes out of the uh, out of wanting to know what is it that water teaches you? Like what? Like if we think of water as a teacher, um, what has water? Um, how has water transformed your um, ideas about the world? About being a person about about social and environmental justice. No, no, you please. You guys are the expert. I'm <laughs> I'm a visual artist. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just talk about um, when I first became, uh, for lack of better words, obsessed with water. <laughs> um, and I was uh, I was in college. I did a study abroad program in Jordan. And noticed that many people, even um, those in the lower class, were drinking bottled water. And you could not drink water from the tap uh, in the city of Amman, the capital of Jordan. Um, and I then proceeded to do some informational interviews. I was there to learn Arabic, but kind of like went really tangential. And met with the um, former Ministry of Water and Irrigation of all of Jordan and he pulled me into his office and it was like this tiny little office and he was like smoking a cigarette and drinking coffee and essentially was like the future of Jordan is doomed. The water is going to run out and there's nothing we can do. And I was 20, 21 at the time. Uh, and I think that really struck a chord in a way that um, that kind of propelled my career into public health and uh, really sparked my desire to really address this issue when it comes to water scarcity and, and hygiene. Um, and uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. I guess I'll start in a different place. Uh, and maybe the way I'll explain it is that when I first came to Columbia University, they asked me to give a talk about water. And the title of the talk I chose to give was The Romance of Water because it reflected my growing up in India. Uh, I was born in a place in northern India called Dharamsara, which is where the Dalai Lama now lives. And my father was a government doctor who traveled by foot all over that region seeing patients. And I tagged along as a two-year-old toddler. And the most visual things I remember about that part of my childhood were um, spending nights along the River Bias. Uh, the River Bias is a mountain river. It has boulders which are five or six feet tall. Uh, in the early morning, you can crawl all, all over the, these boulders as a little kid. Um, in the late afternoon, particularly during the snowmelt period, there's a roaring torrent that moves those boulders many feet. Mm -hmm. So as a three, four, five-year-old, this is one of the fundamental images that's ingrained in my mind. The second one from that period is a picture, which is the only picture I have of my parents and myself at the at this time. And that's also in Dharamsala, and that's on snow. Uh, most people do not think of India as a place with snow, but mm -hmm. that's what it is. And I have a snow bunny in my hand. Um, and this came to my mind as a young adult when I was learning physics and learned that water is the only thing 
that exists in vapor, liquid, and solid form at the same temperature simultaneously, mm -hmm. which is fascinating, isn't it? So anyway, I should stop there. Enough romancing. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a, there's a, like really beautiful um, images of water, and I think that that you know, I mean, obviously, in addition to its central importance uh, for sustaining life on this planet or life as we know it, um, I think it also speaks to the ways in which we we all have a kind of intimate relation to water that it's not just a kind of abstract entity, but rather is, is this kind of um, placeholder for questions of memory and questions of, of, uh, of, of one's sense of one's own history and, mm -hmm. and uh, one's sense of, in your case, uh, maybe a kind of political awakening or, or an, an orientation to a certain kind of um, politics and, and in your sense, maybe more um, spiritual or, or um, uh, sense of the, the overwhelming both beauty but also a power of uh, <laughs> of water um i mean uh one of the so um in the context of vimpa's um uh entire work around the question of water i also wanted to ask you um who do you think owns the water <laughs> and 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 who should own the water, right? Um, and in part, I was also thinking about this question in relationship to um, the fact that after, in 2017, after years of activism by the Maori people, uh, the Wanga, Wanganuru, uh, I'm sorry, I'm butchering, this, butchering the name of this river, but, um, but a river um, in New Zealand was granted the same legal rights as a human. And I'm wondering um, whether that kind of an intervention, whether you see that as potentially useful in the work that you do um, or not useful uh, potentially in, in relationship to the kinds of, of work that you do and in relationship to this question of, of the problematics of ownership. Mm -hmm. So if I may, uh, I mean, in India also now the government is trying to give, uh, uh, you know, the rivers, uh, a living entity and they want to call them, uh, you know, they want to give them the human rights. Um, uh, but lots of states, so Indian, you know, Indian government system is very complicated and very complex where states allow, uh, some states have allowed to say, call the rivers as living beings, um, but other states do, do not agree. So, you know, they want to abuse the river as they want to do that. Uh, but other states where they have called the uh, rivers as living beings, they have lots of different kind of belonging because, you know, the rivers are holy rivers. So they call them mother or, you know, so they pray all the rivers. So certain families, they had this uh, culture where actually they do not go to their work before, uh, you know, saying a prayer to the river. So they have to have uh, the prayer before going for their work. So I think... Um, in a way, it it becomes really helpful for uh, weaving the human behavior around the rivers, and uh, then people take a responsibility of not polluting them. But otherwise, uh, like India, uh, if I can talk about Indian context and uh, you know the colonial making of this urban space of Delhi, uh, where they do not, you know, have the same values as Indian families with the river and they put all the drainages into the river. So, you know, that has uh, been a, uh, one of the key reasons where uh, of river pollution. So, you know, after that, nobody has worked on the drainage system. Still, we have the same drainage system. So that's why the river pollution is constant. And people don't even, people who go and pray there, they don't even realize that. They said, okay, this is a God's wish. It's not, but it's just human made uh, condition to the river. So I think um, the ownership is a, a question to me also because I think ownership shifts with time and space. Uh, so I think that's why I invited all the experts to uh, kind of give me the answers from this part of the world and then I will be having another event in India uh, to question the same thing because I think we are very uncertain about the future of the water or the sustainability of the water. So that's why we are uncertain about the future of the urbanity also. So it's a, it's a big question to me also. So I want to understand from the experts. Yeah. Go for it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the concept of ownership over water 
that the question in itself feels um, like a very capitalist concept yeah. where, you know, the word to own, I mean, do we really own anything? Um, and I think to own water, which is the most fund fundamental element of life, to, to frame it in that way, that in itself feels wrong. Um, so I don't think anybody owns the water. I think it, you know, it, it, What's it's a company's own. <laughs> <laughs> right, but they don't truly own it. Um, and I think that if we were to remove ourselves from this kind of this concept of ownership where we think that we can take hold of this one thing and do whatever we want with it, we would be we would treat water much better than we do. We would use less of it. We would conserve much more of it. We would um, protect it. We would not pollute it. Um, and I think that it's like this this greed that we can take and take and pollute however much we want um, without any repercussions. And the folks who are really suffering the most from this, and, and this is kind of goes back to the work that We Act for Environmental Justice does, is the frontline communities. Um, and so in not thinking about, you know, we in this room, even us in this room, are very privileged to be here. Um, and I'm, one thing I'm very happy about is that we don't have bottled water on this table, which I'm, <laughs> I imagine is, was a very conscious decision. But, um, you know, I go to a lot of these environmental con um, conferences and it's bottled water and it's, it's like these, it's, you're able to detach yourself and talk about how to protect waterways while not thinking about water conservation and how you personally or how your family or how your community uses water. Um, and so I think it, it doesn't belong to anyone. It, it's really, um, it's, it's another element. It's another, almost like another being. And I like the concept of, of giving it human rights. If that's what, if that's the framing that induces respect, then, then that's what it should be. So I don't have anything more to say. You, you got it. <laughs> um, I was going to say no one owns the water, but I was going to frame it slightly differently that maybe that's the problem because only time I've seen people actually pay attention to caring for the resource is when they say this is our water uh, or they want to fight and take somebody else's water. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, you know, what is it? Right. You know, there are lots of other questions linked to uh, the ownership of the water. Uh, like if I talk about different space and time in India, uh, like some upper caste people, you know, they own the water. So still we have uh, very low rights on the natural resources to the lower caste people. So, you know, like if you have Dalit community, which is like um, uh, untouchable, uh, they are called untouchable, which is I'm very ashamed of that. Uh, that India has this kind of caste system that uh, we still deal with those questions which are like maybe ages old where, uh, you know, caste and race uh, divides these natural resources. And a lot of people, they cannot uh, own a well or they cannot have the tap water directly in their houses because they belong to certain castes. So I think the ownership is a very big question in a way that to deal with. And... Um, if you say that it's my own and then also you don't want to protect it because then you abuse it. Right. Then you use it like with great abundance. So, you know, it's uh, I think we need to have some some kind of uh, law or I don't know. Law is also a failed idea. <laughs> I think everything is failing. Uh, <laughs> how to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So right. How will you answer that? I mean, yeah, that's true. I mean, policies and laws that are put in place, you know, I mean, there's many reasons that they're not working. And there's been so many rollbacks on things like the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it does require a mental shift for us to think about this resource and be grateful for it in a way that it um, it gives us life, you know, and, and respecting it in that way. And I, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't have an easy answer, but I think that's, that's what it would be if, for us to get to that place, we would all need to really feel that way. Why is there a water god or goddess? Yeah, yeah. See, yeah. So my my belief is that 
humans are incredibly stupid people. Yeah. Uh, and so you always need something like a god or goddess to point you to what you need to do. That's right. Because, and periodically you pay attention to them, especially when you need resources. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's very absurd to me, actually, yeah. you know, to call the goddess and then abuse it, mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah. Great. Um, so, I mean, you guys have touched on this a little bit already, but um, for me, one of the sort of most interesting things about water is the ways in which it both serves as this connection that really literally connects us to everything around us. Um, uh, it connects the globe. It connects multiple layers of the, the movement from, from, you know, the subterranean up to the atmosphere. There's like this constant circulation of water everywhere, right? So it's literally this kind of connective tissue of of all of us, right? Um, all of the beings on the in the world, all of the all of the the ways in which um, the world is composed, um, but it's also the medium through which you know, as as you all deal with in your work, it's the medium through which um, a lot of injustices are perpetrated, right? It, it, it becomes the medium through which um, toxins can accumulate um, and and tend to accumulate in, in particular. Um, people's bodies, right? So I was thinking, for example, of the ways in which um, persistent organic pollutants have uh, circulated so much around the globe, but then they tend to accumulate in the Arctic, right, which is so far from the place in which they're manufactured, and to the point where um, Inuit women for the longest time were given an advisory to not breastfeed their children, another form of, of water, essentially, or a kind of fluidity of the body, um, because the, the breast milk was so toxic. Right. Um, and so you can see the ways in which water is both this this vector of life, but also um, circulates these very deathly um, capitalist impulses. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about that kind of contradiction um, in the work that you do, the ways in which water both can be served as a kind of mobilizing tool because of its connective powers, um, but also the ways in which that um, can exacerbate existing injustices. Why don't you start this one? Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> well, let me try it this way. How many in the audience believe that humans are changing the planetary climate? Almost all. Okay. How many of you believe that there will be mass migrations because of climate change? Almost all. Okay. So I'm working off of this connectivity yes. idea. This is now <laughs> connecting the whole bloody world, right? Mm -hmm. So now that you acknowledge that there will be mass migrations, how many people do you think will migrate because the planetary temperature went up by two degrees, just because of the temperature aspect? Really? How many people will migrate because the water ran out? See? See? Some of some some people raised hands for both, right? But what I wanted to say was, here's a connected world problem that we have acknowledged. Mm -hmm. In this connected world problem, the the element to use your language that or the currency that people have decided to communicate is that of temperature, because to the scientist who wanted to make that story, that was the easier thing to communicate. The impacts that we get, if you think about Rajasthan in India, uh, these people live in a temperature which in the summer gets out to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. They're not moving, right? But if they run out of water, or for, exa for example, in the case of Bangladesh, if the sea comes in, they are migrating. We are not telling the right story to mobilize the connectivity that should be mobilized in this particular context. I talk about this and they say, oh yeah, that's a very good example of climate change. But it's not, because let's say there was not a climate change happening, but we were polluting the water and we were basically racing to the bottom with respect to groundwater pumping. Those people are going to have to move. They don't have recourse. Worse, it's not the people. The things that are going to be impacted by that are the flora and fauna in that place. Mm -hmm. We are not making that connection. So I'm amazed always that this nice story of the temperature really got where it did. And the more pertinent story of where the water is in this story is not at the forefront at all. That's very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think that 
uh, in terms of connectivity, you look at all these really dire water scarcity issues, for example, um, the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, where you are dealing with, you know, you have the First Nations people who have been fighting for their for their rights since 1492, you know, half a millennium. And there's suddenly this crisis that's been going on for much longer than we know. Uh, and then it's suddenly broadcasted and it brings everybody together in the in the face of crisis to you know stand in solidarity um, you know against this horrible thing that's going to happen you know with these polluted waters um, they're going to affect the health of a nation that's already been deeply exploited um, and that part of it is in a sense very beautiful right to bring all these people together and and fight for this one thing um, but it's it's very sad that it's not until these, you know, extreme crisis modes that we react to anything. Um, and I, I did want to talk about, you, you mentioned um, a very specific example in the Arctic. And I just wanted to, I don't want to get too nerdy here, but I wanted to highlight um, a specific topic called PFAS. Um, and I don't know if, if folks in the room have, are familiar with PFAS. How many people know what PFAS is? Okay, so I saw about four hands go up. Um, but it's very similar in that um, PFAS is a chemical that was, you know, began to be manufactured in the, in the 1930s. It became very popular in the 40s, 50s, 60s by companies like DuPont and 3M in the creation of um, things like Teflon and Scotchgard, things that resist um, oil, water, grease, heat. Um, and it, you know, it boomed and now it's in everything. I mean, if you have a 100% waterproof jacket, if you, um, if you have a nonstick pan, microwave popcorn, like anything that resists oil or grease has PFAS in it. And it's also used in firefighting foams, which is, may sound very random, but because it resists heat, PFAS doesn't break down until it's at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And so the military continues to use um, PFAS. And so who is being affected? Well, obviously all of us. It's in 99% of the Americans' bloodstream. Um, but it's also deeply affecting those who live in frontline communities and EJ community, environmental justice communities, um, people who live near manufacturing sites, people who live on or around military sites. And waters are being poisoned. And the, you know, that's the most fundamental element of life. And that's happening right here in the United States. And it's it's right underneath our nose and we know very little about it. And it is passed. It's also, it you know, it breaks the, the blood brain barrier. It, it mm -hmm. is passed through breast milk. And um, it's, and that's just one example of one chemical that is popularized and that we're using. Um, but just wanted to mention that. I think it's very close to the socks and knocks, uh, which generally ships, you know, we have a lot of, uh, ship communication through the sea and uh, we travel and we ship our stuff, uh, even art for that matter. My my art also carries a lot of carbon footprint. Um, but you know, uh, the sulfuric base oil is being used for the ships and that's very dangerous for the sea. And uh, that's one of the cause where the sea, sea is heating up. So I think uh, we don't even know many, um, many things about, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of... Uh, waterways we are using and uh, the fuel we are using and the yeah. ballast water uh, which is being thrown by the ships while traveling from one country to another country because they fill their uh, you know the containers with water and they bring the water to the other country so how that changes the biodiversity of the whole uh, water uh, you know the sea levels the marine life is completely disturbed because of that so i think there are lots of things we we are unaware as people um, those, you know, those news never come out or we are not concerned because the water issues are not important. Maybe there are other things we focus on other kind of violences, but I think this is the biggest violence right now Earth is facing, uh, you know, so, yeah. Right. And I, and I think we're especially unaware because we believe that our government will protect us. We, you know, we think that's the essential yeah. duty that, you know, who somebody else is taking care of it if it's coming out of our tap then of course it, it must be fine you know why would why would anybody poison its its people but 
Yeah, so I was teaching a class before coming and I asked the students if they were given a device that could take their pee and any other wastewater that they are generating in their apartment and transform that to ultra pure water, would they use it? And none of them would use it. Uh, then I asked, suppose this was cheaper than any other water we could get, would you use it? And one hand went up. So then I asked that, suppose you live in Newark or Flint and there was a, waste, a water treatment plant that was sending water to you, would you drink it? And all hands went up. And I was thinking, I'm living <laughs> on another planet. These people have no concept, <laughs> no concept. of what they're talking about. So then I turned around and I said, so now the, do you realize why I said Newark and Flint? Oh, yeah, they had a problem with their water source. And then you point out, no, it's not a problem with their water source. It's a problem that they have fully treated water that once it, by the time it gets to their tap, has gotten polluted. So mm -hmm. you were happy to drink it. Why wouldn't you drink your own pee? An Indian prime minister used to drink his own pee. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, uh, so the point I'm getting at is that a lot of these things do not make sense because, and partially it is because of the exposure they have had to a particular issue and the way it's presented. In the US, the idea of water reuse was presented by the water industry as from toilet to tap. That's the slogan they used. Mm -hmm. Moreover, they actually attached a picture of a toilet and somebody now drinking off of it. So I think they had a great communication specialist, but not a marketing specialist. <laughs> <laughs> you were also telling me the other day um, on Monday at the dinner about the case of um, Pennsylvania in relationship to, you, you did a study in relationship to kind of consumption of bottled water in the United yeah. States. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, there are some interesting dynamics. Um, bottled water sales now eclipse all other beverage sales, soda, soda style beverage sales in the US. Is this good or is this bad? It's potentially bad because we know bottled water issues, right? Um, but, and that's what the communications person at Columbia wants me to advertise because he believes that. But what we found was that bottled water sales correlate very strongly with drinking water violations reported by utilities to the EPA. And they grossly underreport those because they get fined if they do, even though it's a law. And they correlate even more highly with diarrheal medicine sales. So it's not a joke. Mm -hmm. People are actually responding to that. And these are typically poorer people because the poorer communities are where the financing for maintaining these systems is inadequate. And that's what's happening. So that's the story she wanted me to tell you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, because that's where we got the data. <laughs> Not any, <laughs> the reality is that if you actually look at the map of bottled water sales, which we have the data for, but we don't. We didn't have everything else to work with. Um, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, Florida, Alabama, through to Maine, uh, going through the Appalachian region. This is the same story. So it's not peculiar to Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lubna, I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit more about um, WEAC's uh, relationship to the. Um, faces of climate change project that uh, that you did and and thinking about um, how climate change is affecting northern Manhattan. Yeah. Um, so climate change is affecting northern Manhattan. It's affecting everyone. Um, but we particularly with we act we work in we primarily highlight the community of northern Manhattan. So that's West Central East Harlem, Washington Heights, and Inwood. Um, and we really work to build healthy communities by ensuring that low-income communities and communities of color are participating meaningfully in, in the fair and sound creation of environmental health policies and practices. And we have been really working hard to get people to understand what climate change is, which it is not an intuitive thing to understand. Climate change, a lot of times, especially in black and brown communities, is considered this like, um, like a white buzzword. It's like this granola topic, and people really don't think that um, it necessarily affects them. 
And we've really been seeing the effects of climate change, especially in recent years with extreme heat. Uh, you see this in urban areas, especially where in the summertime, EJ communities, environmental justice communities, have less access, for example, to air conditioners. And so, uh, you know, you don't have an air conditioner, it's over 100 degrees outside, you have the heat island effect, so, you know, the heat is, is building and it's like radiating off the pavement. People are hot, um, you know, even if you turn a fan on, it's just like circulating warm air around your apartment. And then even, you know, further to get into the environmental justice issues, you may live in communities where you don't want to open your window for safety reasons. Um, you know, you may not go outside and go for a walk because your neighborhood might not be safe. Um, and so we've been really trying to address these issues from that perspective. Um, so an example of like how we do that in, in workshops is looking at um, sea level rise, for example, as you mentioned, which sea level rise, you know, melting ice caps, people are like, okay, I don't care about that because it does not affect me directly. But talking about sea level rise as in this will make the sea level rise, your community may experience flooding. Flooding may get into your house, which will lead to the presence of mold, um, which will then exacerbate your families and your asthma, and you will need to go to the hospital and you may not have healthcare coverage. And so we've been trying to connect the dots that way by really talking to people about their health, their family's health. Um, Thank you. But do you think this kind of effort works? Yeah, I think it does. Um, we, you know, we do workshops in the community and, and people come back because they're not only learning, but they're learning uh, strategies for prevention. Um, so one, to protect their own health and their community's health, but really looking at themselves as a global player and thinking about what they can do. I mean, the thing is mm -hmm. with environmental justice communities, those are the least polluting people that have the, you know, who are the most severely impacted. Um, but we really engage folks at the level of organizing and advocacy as well, where you know, we're a membership-based organization. So um, we have a membership of over 700 local residents who we engage with on a monthly basis. We have membership meetings. One month we might be talking about the toxicity of personal care products. The next month, we might be talking about a piece of climate change legislation at the state level. And the following week, we might take some members in a bus up to Albany to meet with some elected officials and tell their story, you know, what, for example, regarding um, extreme heat, and have those elected officials see the people that their policies are impacting. Um, and so that meaningful, you know, being able to put uh, like lay people in front of decision makers uh, is very impactful, yeah. That's good. Um, I was just going to ask one more question and then turn it over uh, to you guys because I know there's a lot of uh, water experts um, and uh, probably some questions um, from the audience. But um, before I do that, I wanted to ask, what is the role of interdisciplinarity in your work? Or, I mean, we can think about interdisciplinarity in terms of, um, you know, different types of knowledge, so not, not necessarily just in a kind of academic sense, but like, but the role of, of how people come to think about the world and, and, the, and, the, and how that functions in terms of your work, like the, the different types of, of coming to know the world, the different ways of knowing the world. You can think about that from an artistic perspective. I mean, for or... me, interdisciplinary, uh, it really uh, matters for my practice. Because I think I uh, use other people's research work because I am not a person who research myself because I am not a data person. So I really depend on the re researchers and scientists to give me the data. So I, I really have no say that um, it's right or wrong. I have no say, but yes, I go with the data and I go with the intuition and the feeling around me because I think I'm studying my times uh, time and space in Delhi, you know, the effect is very clear. So it's very evident. The air is really polluted right now. The India is going through really, really, really catastrophic times because, you know, it looks very ap apocalyptic if you see all the pictures. So people are waiting for the rains there. So, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, for me, it's very important to bring the fact from other disciplines 
uh, people who are researching, people who are actually fighting for the environment justice, uh, people who are fighting for the communities to have their clean water and clean air rights. Um, I think uh, uh, my work really gathers information from these places. And I think it's uh, the planet is going through such a time that where we all need to get together, you know, irrespective of your fields or work, whatever it is, I think we all need to come together as human beings and uh, work together. Um, yeah, at, at, at WE ACT, um, I think our work is very interdisciplinary. It's, we have such a wide variety of folks on staff, um, both in terms of profession, in terms of um, socioeconomic background, in terms of race. Um, we have folks that work on climate, energy, um, policy wonks, people who are just really good writers and know how to convey the information properly. Um, and you know, we we really are a collaborative organization. Uh, we, for example, work with our partners at Columbia University and Mount Sinai to help inform the research. You know, talk to them about what are the most pressing things that our community is facing, and how can we do research on them. And once that research is done, which is you know, may take 10, 15 years, we t we help take that research and translate it. And sometimes that literally means into Spanish to for like monolingual Spanish speaking communities. And sometimes that means, you know, I'm not trying to see like P values and graphs and mm -hmm. charts and stuff. What does this mean for me? Right. Like, what does this mean for my health and what can I do to change it? That's the bottom line. Um, and so we, you know, we we take the science and, and we we make it applicable uh, for people to, to easily understand and also really work hard on this advocacy piece to influence policy change because unless you know laws and regulations are put in place um, that's kind of one of the most effective ways to really strong arm and and you know ensure that change is going to happen so i think it's really boring to meet and talk to people who are just like you. That's the first problem. <laughs> the second problem is that we have lemmings and you know what happens to lemmings. You just follow them over the cliff. So that's a bad idea. And <laughs> since I'm in engineering, one of the things that people associate with engineers is the mindset must be that if you build it, they'll come. When we know that doesn't happen either. So in terms of interdisciplinarity, the, the thing is that if you really want to understand, which is the prerequisite for being able to say anything about what might happen in the future, because that's what we are trying to fix, then you have to talk to people who actually might have a different idea than you do, because mm -hmm. otherwise you're in total tunnel vision. The university is a fantastic place to meet crazy people. <laughs> it's getting worse rather than better, unfortunately. More and more people are going into tunnel vision because they have to research very specialized things and then mm -hmm. uh, write about that same specialized thing 500 times so that they are really, really <laughs> known for that one specialized thing. But periodically, you can catch such people and make them not do that. And that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the work of the, the Water Center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great. Okay. Well, I was going to turn it over. Rachel, did you want to so say we something? We have microphones since oh. we are, are live streaming. Um, did anyone have any have any questions for our panelists? So, so I grabbed it. Very <laughs> selfish of me, but um, but I'm just fascinated by what you were saying a little earlier about the the metaphor and the story and the way we frame it. Um, when you were talking about, we're, we're always talking about two degrees warmer rather than mm -hmm. the water story. So I'm really curious from all of you, how do we retell that water story in a more compelling way? You're the one, you should um, start. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, I'm trying my best if, uh, uh, so this was one of the reason that I have, um, kind of thought of this project, who owns the water, because I think I'm not a water expert like you guys, but uh, um, but I think art can bridge the gap. So art, writing, storytelling, c 
community workshops. I think these are the answers to convey the stories. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of NGOs and um, lots of organizations. They're working around, uh, you know, the natural resources and the scarcity, you know, so they are conveying these issues. But I think sometimes people find it little boring, if I'm borrowing that word. Um, so it's uh, art becomes very accessible to people and i think we can tell the stories in a very emotional uh, way so i i for me aesthetic is uh, aesthetics is the best answer to uh, kind of convey the problems of present uh, scenarios so that's where i come from yeah for me i mean i don't know how we would tell the story i imagine that we would I feel like one of the most effective ways would be to go back to our First Nations people, to to the indigenous people of this land who have always had a spiritual connection with water, who deeply respect it, um, and you know, look to them to to for guidance. You know, and I I don't even feel appropriate in like providing a suggestion because I you know I don't know. Um, that said. I think it's also important to recognize your audience and know who, how receptive people will be to a message. So, you know, if I'm somebody who lives in my ivory tower and I only drink bottled water and I run my tap for fun and laugh while I'm doing it, <laughs> then, you know, hearing the story of a First Nation person and, and um, that might not resonate with me. Um, so I, I don't have an answer, but I, I think it's... Um, somewhere in between. So I'm struggling and seeking the answer, right? Um, I, I agree with you. It has to be customized to different people because they react to different things. So if I look at the climate change story, until Al Gore created that inconvenient mm -hmm. tooth, mm -hmm. uh, students who came into my classes knew nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And the story on climate change started with Congress in 1988. So that was 12 years. Uh, when and locally, when uh, after Hurricane Sandy hit New York, it seems like every person thinks that if they had a bad sneezing fit, it's also associated with climate change. So it's like, you know, you seems like you cross a threshold and uh, it's overkill almost. How we cross such a threshold with water is not clear to me at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the Clean Water Act got passed, right? That's a landmark thing in the U.S. context. Okay. And the Cuyahoga River had to catch on fire a few times mm -hmm. for that in the New York Times to report it. I don't know if that's what we need. Yeah, and I, um, for me, I mean, one of the ways I really connect with water is um, it's kind of like this absence makes the heart grow fonder type of thing. So when folks don't have it, then you really appreciate what you don't have. Um so, you know, I, uh, I identify as Muslim. I'm not a very strong practicing Muslim, but I do fast um, every year. And, you know, 30 days of fasting when you're not drinking water from sunrise to sunset, that makes you really love water. <laughs> um, so, you know, just thinking about what might work for people, that, but that requires a willpower, that re requires a willingness to learn and to step out of your comfort zone to, to get to a place of... Um, higher understanding. So what you're saying is we should popularize a drink no water, use no water day. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. And see how long, yeah, yeah if yeah. you can, if you can bear it, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't pass out, yeah. you win, right? <laughs> Hello. Is this working? It's working. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, some of you might already know me. Uh, my point with climate change is also like, how do you, well, climate change is one problem and rising nationalism is another problem. And the more we work together, the more people are pulling out of agreements, people are destroying the thing in a gravity that is like 5,000 times more than our work put together. So I think the, for me, the challenges are two. One is the, the leaders or the rulers that are kind of destroying the planet. And I, I would like to take it, part of it is my fault too, but I don't really want to take claim for uh, the significant amounts of destruction that's happening. So for me, is this conundrum of, yes, it's all the human responsibility, but I also think it's like 50 horrible people 
or 60 horrible people wantedly destroying significant amount of the planet. So I want to kind of put that out in the thing rather than, yes, all humans should be blamed anyway. The second one is this idea of saving the planet, which I always had really difficulty understanding that, I mean, it always sounds like there's a messianic thinking that the Messiah is going to come and change. But then I'm also kind of glad maybe we are trying to move away from the messianic and think that we have to collectively come together to do something. And then I want to just kind of think whether we have passed that thing of some messi messiah is going to come and change uh, the planet into a kind of a prior stage that it was, as opposed to like what we are discussing, which is what I think Viba and I've been working in terms of coming together in much more active way to find more solutions, sustainability, customized, as we said, for different kinds of communities and uh, territories. <laughs> Does anyone want to respond to that? Maybe, my name. So, um, yeah, I don't know if this is working, but you talked a little bit about bottled water versus tap water uh, a few minutes ago. And as a person living in New York City in a building that is lead infested and mold infested, we drink large bottles of water, but not the small ones. But um, and in communities like Flint and in other places where tap water is really polluted, and I'm sure in many developing countries where the water is really polluted. Um, what's the solution for people who really don't have clean water options at home? Yeah, I mean, I and think- And what happens to the bottles? Yeah, I mean, I think the interim solution, if you have a lead infested um, water source, uh, if you have you know, pollutants in your water and that's known, it is bottled water. That is the interim solution. Um, but it's not a long-term solution. It's not sustainable in any way. And we know that much of the plastic ends up in our oceans. And, you know, we've all seen those like horrible images um, in social media and on the news of, you know, these like animals that are like bellies are full of plastic. Um, and that's where our plastic ends up, you know. Um, but I think it really is in... Um, organizing and activism and holding people that need to be protecting our health accountable. Um, you know, it, maybe you're, you're, uh, you're the owner of your building, uh, landlords, but then, right. But then it, but thinking about that, like who, who has claimed themselves responsible for this thing? Are they doing a good job? If not, how can we hold them accountable for that? Um, Right. It is the city, right? And so when, uh, when I when I say like owners and landlords, those are the folks that we can help organize to be a voice, to you know make change at the city or state level to actually get um, lead pipes out of our drinking water system. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't. I don't mean to like guilt or shame people for drinking bottled water if it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. What bothers me is when somebody hears about a story in Flint and they live in this affluent community and suddenly think that their water is poisoned too. And then they're like, bottled water for everyone. <laughs> and it's just like, no, 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 <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. So there's so many different things in this, right? Um, okay, so Columbia University is having the year of water, whatever that means. And as part of that, they're not serving bottled water. Mm -hmm. So what are they doing? They're serving a can, an aluminum can that says water on it. Mm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? So we have lots of adaptation <laughs> stories to communication strategies that yeah. people have. The fundamental problem here is what you brought up is you have a right to expect that you should be able to get water that is drinkable mm -hmm. and doesn't cause you harm. And so the question is, how do we get there, right? Now, in the examples we have in the US, interestingly, in 1884, 
a professor from my department at Columbia University presented a paper at the New York Academy of Science saying lead pipes are a bad idea for the following reasons. Those reasons have not changed in 140 years, right? Mm. We are still there. So there's something about humans which seems to want to make sure that we don't all grow old and get Alzheimer's. <laughs> so we still have to solve this. So if we look at the current situation as to why lead is suddenly emerging, those pipes have been there for a long time. Why now, right? So the typical examples we have, which there are going to be a lot more coming, by the way. Yeah. So Newark, let's start there. Um, what's happened here is that in 2012, the US EPA required all utilities to implement something called the disinfection byproducts rule. What this was motivated by was that if you had organic carbon somehow in the water supply, this could be water coming from a surface water reservoir and didn't get cleaned up adequately. And you had chlorine, which is what we were using for disinfection, you formed carcinogenic compo compounds. And the idea was we should not be doing this anymore because mm -hmm. this is a certain percent risk. Okay. Mm -hmm. So New York City shifted to ultraviolet disinfection and ozone. But those two things don't last through the system, okay? So if you have pipes that you're very confident do not have breaks and could not get cross-contaminated, you can do that. New York does not. They, they have not had the money to really fix all these holes in their pipes. Uh, they're like India in that respect, yeah. or worse, you know, maybe depending yeah. where you are. So they didn't know quite what to do because their dosage of chlorine is high so that it can make it through to the very, very ends of the system so that people don't get diarrhea. So they were given advice by some consultant that if you add chemical X, which will lower the acidity, sorry, increase the acidity, lower the pH of the water, then the, the disinfection byproducts would not form and you can continue using chlorine. So this is now a well-intentioned strategy, but what that higher acidity did was strip the coating on the lead pipe. So for the last three years, kids have been drinking lead. They were not before that, right? So my point is that this is not something that needed to happen and you living in New York do not need to be scared, et cetera, right? So, so this is you know one side of it. The other side of it is, that what's really the story telling us? The story is telling us that it took three years for someone to figure out that this was going on. Mm -hmm. And that was the Environmental Defense Fund mm -hmm. doing lead testing on blood of children. That's where it came from. This could have gone on forever if they hadn't. These children would get dumber and dumber and more and more violent because of lead. So what your original question leads to is somehow we need to be able to test for the water quality, not at the treatment plant where it was perfect, but at the point of yeah. use. Why are we not yeah. doing that? Yeah. We have now reached technical capacity to be able to do that. So if you start there, then the question, next question comes uh, as to, okay, if we can do this, what's the cost? Because invariably that's going to be an issue. And then, okay, you're finding out that the water is bad at that point. What should you do? So we have gone full circle and we are back to that same problem. So my answer to that personally is that if you move to doing the treatment of the water closer to where you are using it, and then you have something that tells you whether it's okay or not, that's a pathway. That's the longer term answer to the question you know, that you were bringing up. And I've talked a long time, so I should shut up. Um, thank you guys for this really insightful conversation. It builds on a really exciting conversation earlier in the week. And I know um, there were a lot of themes that you've touched tonight. One that I was hoping you could explore more was the the questions around civic and public engagement to spur action. And I know the, the stories from We Act um, are really motivating and powerful. Mm -hmm. As you've set your agenda, can you describe how citizens have um, helped shape the agenda for an organization and change the course or how 
how the citizens have helped inform the research prerogatives mm -hmm. so that you know people that might not have thought as seen themselves as experts initially could really take on a leadership role in how these how these challenges are addressed in their communities yeah um so at we act the staff really considers ourselves as a mouthpiece for the community um we create a, a clear distinction between the community-based organization and the community members. Um, we are not, we don't, we don't advertise ourselves as community members. The community members are the experts. They, you know, this was their lived experience. Many people, especially in northern Manhattan, have, um, you know, lived there their whole lives, have had generations of people live there, and they really know the roots of the community, the transitions it's been through. And so we do tap into their expertise. Um, I mean, there are many different structures at WE Act. Um, so with our membership base, in addition to having monthly meetings where we uh, have conversations, where we not, not only are like delivering and teaching information, we're gaining information from our members. We have several different working groups. Um, so we have a climate justice working group, a healthy homes working group, things that we organize um, and see who's interested. They sign up, they come to these meetings that we organize, we facilitate, um, but the agendas for those meetings, the skeleton we provide, but the content is really community driven. Um, and we also have a planning committee as well. And so for example, right now for 2020, we're working on our policy agenda. And so we've looked at what we've worked on in the past year, two years, uh, what's going to carry over into 2020. And the next people that are going to see that are the planning committee. Those are our community members. They're going to weigh in on what, whether or not they think that the policies that we've outlined are relevant, um, what else, what's missing, what, what do we need to con continue focus on, what, do we, what are we not seeing at all. Maybe it's an emerging is issue. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we, it's, it's definitely like an iterative process and there's a, a strong feedback loop. Like, as I mentioned, there's, there's research, there's advocacy, there's organizing, and it all feeds into each other. Um, and it's not linear at all. I'd like to ask the moderator <laughs> um, for some of your thoughts, because I know you're also involved with thinking about water and some of your larger uh, projects around the, the whole idea of the anth Anthropocene. And uh, perhaps there's an assumption that who owns the water sounds so like it's, it's very uh, anthro-human uh, oriented. So I just wondered your thoughts. Um, so water, water is a kind of funny figure in my thinking. I mean, actually, um, the project that I've been working on for, uh, the last, um, 10 years or so, um, has actually been more properly about plastic. So, um, so I've been thinking about the sort of inverse of water, right? the, like the hydrophobe aspect, um, rather than, rather than water itself. Um, but, uh, but I think that one of the things that's really interesting about water, um, both like conceptually, but also actually physically, is the ways in which it forces us to think about questions of fluidity, right? Like, like um, and when you were talking about the rise of kind of like rise of nationalism um, in conjunction with the rise of of all of these environmental problems, right? From from water table issues and clean water, clean drinking water issues to questions of climate change. I mean, I think that that part of the um, Part of of what water I think has to teach us is about the kind of the ebbs and flows of things, right? So, for example, the um, the border between um, Italy, Italy and Switzerland recently had to be redesignated a moving border because of the fact that the glaciers there are melting, mm -hmm. um, and the water line was the original designation between the two countries. So, like in the Alps. Um, where the water would flow on either side was how the, how each country was delineated. And now because the the glaciers themselves are melting, um, the border is shifting. Um, and I think that that 
you know, in the most kind of hopeful case, right, that is that is an example of what we need to be thinking through, right? Like your example about the questions of migration, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. we need to be thinking through how we are going to be more fluid in this world, right? How we are going to create structures um, that allow for more fluidity of movement, right? Rather than less, right? Which is unfortunately the direction that we seem to be going in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think like that, that is that is sort of the thing that that immediately comes to mind when I when I think about um, questions of water in relationship to our our present moment. Um, I was just thinking about this problem of water conservation and the and ur urban environment, um, especially in relation to. Um, India and Bangalore and Chennai at the moment, um, where lakes uh, where um, have been filled up and cities have grown over these lakes, which has resulted in the water table kind of um, disappearing. Um, and the only solution that governments are coming up with is sort of desalination plants and things like this, which just make the situation worse um, rather than um, revitalizing water bodies. I'm wondering if uh, you know of examples of urban spaces that have successfully mm -hmm. um, done something, um, you know, positive. If there's been kind of political will in places, not political, but there are some communities in India, you know. So there are uh, some engineers um, who have actually uh, looked into the lakes. So uh, lake water is being cleaned by actually two. Uh, very young engineers. Uh, one is uh, in Delhi, the Hoskas Lake. So that has been cleaned by creating these little islands with uh, plants which actually clean the water, which help clean the water. And in Bangalore also, uh, there is this guy, Anand Malingwad. He is doing fantastic work with the lakes and they are making these floating islands, which are like uh, water plants, basically, which cleans the water. So that has tremendously helped uh, uh, the lakes to be clean now and you know there are other initiatives taken by local groups uh, and religious groups also religious groups are also helping because they call the mother um, you know the river as god goddess so you know that is also helping in a way because uh, they take their own initiatives but you know the government and the public sector they are not coming together so that's a, a very big problem because i think we are not connecting the dots with science, uh, politics, economy, and the public itself. So if we connect all the dots together, I think that's going to bring uh, the better solution and the quicker solutions. Because right now, I think we need to be quick rather than slow. Or thinking about the policies or programs, I think we need to act now, like mm -hmm. we act. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, it's very important that we accelerate our uh, uh, efforts towards this and communities are some communities are doing in India I don't know about here I mean uh, I'm not very aware of US policies and uh, but I'm learning from you guys yeah thank mm -hmm. you yeah. Um, I would say one of the bigger solutions and uh, that we have been seeing in the US is a lot of tree planting so um, planting more plants trees we need to be creating more permeable surfaces where places that can actually catch and retain water um, so that it stays where it lands. Uh, right now, you know, we have so much concrete, you know, we're in the concrete jungle right here. Um, it rains and then it's runoff and then our sewer system is overflowed and you get these combined sewer overflow incidents. And if we had much more vegetation to retain the water, um, you know, it would, we would be much better off. The, the issue obviously is in areas that are dealing with the extreme scarcity issue. So like in the Western states, um, there is very little rainfall. And even though there is a lot of vegetation, um, it's, you know, for example, the Colorado River, for example, mm -hmm. is being sucked dry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when it comes down to like a, a use pattern where we need to it's all very holistic. I mean, it's like not only from a personal consumption place, but in terms of climate, we need to really start thinking about stuff holistically because 
the reason that there are droughts and there are wild, wildfires is because of climate change and because the, the earth is being heated. I don't know, not nearly as optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with Vipha that where there is evidence of bottom up action and is sustained, uh, there are some examples, but at smaller scale communities, large cities uh, are marked by, I'm more sympathetic to his points from before. Uh, some of you probably heard about Cape Town Day Zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was, this is complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way that it was presented was a climate change story, which is why I was saying now if you sneeze, you know, it's climate change as well, because it's really gone too far with some of these things where mismanagement is very effectively covered up by a climate change story. Mm -hmm. In the case of Cape Town, um, the I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention, honestly. I mean, okay, they're going to run out of water. It's very interesting, but not beyond that. Then when they started talking about this is a 10,000 year drought and mm -hmm. how this is evidence of climate change, it always makes me nervous because you don't have that much data to start calculating a 10,000 year event. So what are you really doing? You know. Mm -hmm. So when I looked into it, the short version of the story is this. Uh, I was able to find rainfall data going back to 1870 or something. There are three major droughts in 140 years. So that's not a 10,000 year drought that are comparable to this. So what happened? How did it become a 10,000 year drought? The people who were doing that took data starting in 1974. You want to know when the previous big drought was? 1970 to 73. Mm. You know, so this is the kind of thing that's worrisome. What was the real reason for their having a day zero? Uh, it was they had reservoirs that were designed and operated primarily for urban use. They had a very wet spell from about the mid 90s through 2010, 12. So the reservoirs were always full and spilling. So the politicians, his favorite target, uh, they decided that we should, this is such a waste of water. Why don't we allow agriculturalists to have water from these reservoirs and promote high value agriculture? So now the drought shows up. They keep giving those people water. They keep giving the city water. No one curtails anything. That's mm -hmm. how you get to day zero. And we've uh, since then, I've researched this. And mm -hmm. there are many, many places where they've made lists of the top 20 cities where you're going to have day zero. This is a bigger issue of management. Chennai, as you were pointing yeah. out, is a similar issue. Yes, there's climate attributes to all of these. Of course, you don't get a drought spontaneously out of nowhere. It's a climate artifact. But... You know, to start making claims of this kind people do nowadays is obf obfuscation of the reality. Yeah. And I think urban planning also adds to it. Mm -hmm. so you know how, like you were mentioning that we are in concrete jungles. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I think uh, the cities have not been very well planned. Yeah. That, uh, like Delhi was super well planned earlier. You know, when Delhi was planned by Mughals. Uh, so, you know, there were waterways and you know they made the bavlis you know the uh, water reservoirs uh, water wells uh, uh, to the end of the uh, you know the creeks so you know the creeks were very well planned and the uh, wells were very well planned but now with the whole new city plan everything is uh, you know shifted and all those creeks are being filled with concrete so you know now the wa water can flood the city so you know the whole planning has changed Well, I think, uh, not that, that we have to end with a flood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, we're not ending with a flood because we're going to have a reception. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think the very complexity of, of the conversation is, is so rich and, and really allows us to, whether we come out optimistic or pessimistic or optimistic and pe pessimistic, which may be closer to the truth, um, it's been a fabulous conversation, Viva. Congratulations on this great project. Thank you. And and a way of bringing um, bringing all of us together. I think everyone here in the room. So please join me in giving a big hand to our panelists. <laughs>